Welcome back to day 51 of Bitwise, where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, today we continue with all things logic design and uh, other things related to hardware description languages. Uh, pretty much where we left off on Friday. Um, I mentioned that last time I had been hoping to have some time to start working on simulator stuff and other related sort of language processing uh, aspects, uh, but we ended up spending more time on uh, doing comparators and, and things like that, uh, kind of early stages of an ALU. So we didn't get to that, which is fine, because I think this is probably more um, more suited for sort of startup stuff anyway. But uh, today I do want to spend a bunch of time on um, sort of various kinds of graph processing and simulation related tasks. Uh, before I do that, though, um, a few a few follow up remarks. Um, let's see. Uh, what was the one I wanted to show? Example what? Um, right, example three, maybe, example four. Um, so last time I also covered balanced reduction trees when you have an associative operator. Uh, I may not have called out that specific property of associativity is what allows you to uh, execute it in parallel or to minimize the circuit step, circuit depth by having a binary tree. Um, but it looked like this. And so um, what it allows us to do this rather than having a linear chain is the fact that XOR and many other operators are associative. And, and if you don't re remember your math, um, associativity in this case means that this is true. Um, so you can regroup, you know, you can first XOR Y and Z and then XOR X on the left. Uh, uh, or you can first XOR X and Y and then C on the right. Um, and associativity still respects the order. You'll see that both on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, the order goes X, Y, Z. Um, some people get it confused with commutativity, which is this. That's when you can reverse the operands. And of course, you can do this recursively. Uh, if you can do this recursively in an expression, it means you can reorder the operands into any order and get the same result. That's actually the case for XOR, but I want to emphasize that in order to get this kind of binary tree, which minimizes the depth. Um, you actually don't need commutativity, you just need associativity. So associativity, uh, which is sort of the, the freedom to parenthesize big expressions um, as you will, as long as you preserve the order, is what lets you do this sort of stuff in, uh, in parallel efficiently. Uh, but um, I want to make, make a small note, um, which maybe I'll elaborate on later when we have better ways of measuring delay in a realistic setting. But um, if you think about why depth is good to minimize, the basic presumption is that um, the delay is somehow related to the depth. So um, if you want to calculate the delay uh, until this this ultimate output is computed, um, it's essentially the it's it's the delay over the worst case path, right? So there's going to be a worst case path, the so-called critical path, which is um, uh, which is the path through the circuit, and in fact, not just through this part of the circuit, but also through anything else connected to it on the outside. Here we're just looking at a submodule, mind you. Um, we're trying to minimize that maximum delay over any path. And uh, structuring it this way has the benefit, like if you imagine using, um, I mean, I can even show it to you. Um, if, you if we go back to the linear reduce, um, the reason this is worse uh, from a max delay perspective is that while this node here, number seven, has a very short path to the root of this tree, um, zero and one have a very long path. Like they have a path that's seven operators deep, whereas this one is only seven deep. So if you assume that the input delay of all these different bits is the same, then in order to minimize the maximum delay through the circuit, you want to balance the delays across the different inputs. Um, but it actually turns out that that's not always what you want to do because it's it's not infrequent at all. Uh, let me just rerun this. So let's go back to the, uh, the binary circuit. Um, it's not uh, it's not infrequent at all that some of the inputs. I mean, actually, in practice, if you base this on actual measured or estimated delay data from a bigger circuit, these these are never going to have the exact same so-called arrival time, which is basically how early they're ready to 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 how early the value stabilize, which means you can compute a, a stable output from them. Um, so some of these effectively, the input delays are not going to be sym symmetric across the different input bits. Uh, you might, for example, have that bit seven here um, has a much longer delay before it, it arrives. 
in which case the fact that it has to pass through three levels like everyone else is actually bad. Uh, you would want to, at the expense of maybe making uh, the tree for the other seven uh, elements a little bit deeper, you would want to move this thing closer to the root so that it has to go through less stuff because it's a late arriving signal. So this is a very common idea in logic design. You try to put late, arrived, late arriving signals closer to the root of these sort of reduction trees. Um, and it turns out you can actually do that in um, automatically if you have a commutative operator. Um, in this case, you could actually do it even for an associative operator because it happens to be the last element. But unless the late arriving signal is the first or last element of the sequence you're reducing, um, in which case you can in fact move them basically up up the tree, uh, either on this path here or on this path here in order to bring them closer to the root and skew the tree in their favor. Um, but if you wanted to do the same thing for something like three or four that's sort of in the middle of the sequence, then um, without commutativity, you have no way of bringing it uh, as, as close to the root as you want. So um, let me just show you, um, let me just show you, I wrote something here this weekend, which I, th I thought was a good follow up to that. Um, let me show you a version of reduce, which now assumes you have a, um, um, a commutative operator, which means it's going to change the order in which things are combined. But for things like XOR and 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 OR, that's perfectly fine. And so you have the same basic setup, um, but now I've chosen, actually these are not the best ways to illustrate it because these can actually be brought to the root even without reordering things. Um, so maybe let me choose some other ones like uh, three and four. So same structure, but now it's three and four. And so these are not the original first and last elements of the list. And you can see now, uh, four which has a very big delay relative to everything else everything else has a delay of one but then two or 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 uh marked as having specially large delays so number four has a delay of 10 and you can see that as a result um this it tries to minimize um the delay to the output from that uh, late arriving signal by putting it closer to the root three is sort of intermediate it doesn't you know well actually it can't put both of them at the root anyway but it puts it one level below that uh, and then everything else that has the same delay of one is at the same level. So for this part of the circuit, you can see it still has a binary tree, but then for these other late arriving signals, uh, it kind of uh, skews the structure a little bit in order to minimize the maximum delay. And you'll see that a result of this is that um, if you look at this one, two, three, four, five, six, like this part here is basically a binary tree, although it's not a power of two number of elements. So um, maybe that, uh, let me try to maybe make that even more symmetric by making that 10. Because now you have you have these two outliers that are late arriving, but everything else is, you have eight of them, so they have internally a perfect, complete binary tree. Um, but then you can see they have to go through two additional levels. But that's still, it's still a win to do, the, do it this way, because each of these has an input delay of one, and then I marked the XOR operators as having a, a propagation delay of one as well, which may or may not be realistic, but it's just kind of an example. So if you compute the path delay here, it's one for the arrival delay, uh, and then plus one, plus one, plus one, so that's four, five, six. Um, however, if you look at this thing here, three has delay four, so that's five, six. So it balances this delay here. If we tried to make something that where these nodes travel through fewer operators on the way to the root, it would be at the expense of making the critical path delay through three be larger than that. So it balances the delays. And similarly here, this thing has delay 10. And so the, actually the critical path delay overall is going to be 11 because this is the critical path. Um, so, so despite the fact that these are balanced, in some sense, this is maybe not even necessary. Like you could be even more skewed with these internal nodes than, than this binary tree because ultimately they're going to be limited by this critical path from, uh, from this 10 delay node. But nevertheless, for each subsection, it tries to minimize the delay, even though from a, if all you care about is the ultimate output delay, you could actually be more loose with the internal structure here for these things that are uh, very short delay. Um, but let me talk about how this works because the algorithm is extremely simple. The basic idea is you just have a min heap, so you have a priority queue, and you repeatedly pull off, um, and the key for the priority queue is the delay. And so you start out with all the input nodes, 
Uh, here, you start off with all of them associated with their input delay, and then you repeatedly pick off the two things with the minimum delay, and you combine them. And then you put a, the node back in the tree with, uh, with the max delay computed, which is the maximum over the two input branches plus the propagation delay for the operator, and you put that back in the heap. And then you just repeatedly pull off pairs and reduce them with the operator to one node, updating the delay accordingly. And you continue doing that until you're down to one node, which is the root, and then you're done. Um, and so this is really just, uh, you know, if, if you write this, um, if you give everything the same delay, this is actually just a weird version of the previous. Um, this is just a weird version of what we did originally. Oh, there's 10, so that's not a power of 2. Um, this is just a... An, let's see here. Um, this is just another way of writing what we had originally. And in fact, if you think about what is happening with this priority queue, it a effectively acts like a non-priority queue because of the way the keys are ordered um, when you do this addition. So it finishes all of one layer before it moves to the next layer. And so it ends up being the same as before, but just done in a weird way. But um, if you override some of the delays from their default, then you, you get this sort of thing. So anyway, this is one of the cool properties of commutativity is you can sort of permute the order to move some things closer to the root of the tree and thus minimize the maximum delay over any branch. Uh, this is a very simple-minded way of doing it. Uh, but uh, in the limited framework we're discussing things, um, I think it kind of illustrates the idea pretty nicely, and it's uh, it's not you know it's like ten lines of code or whatever it is. All right, um, simulation stuff. Um, someone's asking, is that based on the length of the trace or something else? So w what do you mean length of the trace? Do you mean like a, a trace on a circuit board or a wire or uh, something like that? Um, like the basic idea of path delay is you associate a min... In this case, we only care about max delay. We care about the maximum time it takes for any input to propagate to some out to, to, to a given output. Um, and so the way delay is defined is, you know, uh, operators have propagation delays, uh, which is basically the time it takes from when an input arrives to when the output uh, is computed. And then you can just add those up. Um, you can just add those up along any, yeah, like trace or a path. People usually call it a path over any path. Uh, and the max is so that if you have, if a node has two different inputs, then it can only compute the final output once both of the input signals have arrived with their final values. And so you have to take the max over the, uh, over the delays of the inputs. So it doesn't matter if one input arrives super early, if the other one arrives late, the late arriving input dictates uh, ultimately when the output is, uh, of their combination is ready. So if you wanted to compute the, uh, the output delay of this node, you would take max of the input delays of those two operands, add the operator delay, um, which is the delay of the operator once the inputs are ready. Um, and then, yeah, and, and so that's the delay model. And in practice, in order to compute this kind of thing, you have to characterize your semiconductor process and you need a model for wire delay and all this other stuff. So here I'm just treating these as, as numbers you plug in. Uh, in reality, of course, it depends on the layout and the process technology and all this other stuff. So uh, this is just a, a simple-minded delay model, but um, it's uh, one of the nice things about this kind of approach is that you can extract the delays from uh, from from a fancy model, um, and as long as the, com the method of combination is reasonably uh, appropriate, um, you can still get something useful out of this sort of simple model. Yep. All right. Yeah, I'll talk more about when we get to flip flops. I'll talk about specifically about how uh, the maximum delay limits your how how quickly you can clock the circuit. But even if you're looking at things from uh, from sort of a combinational asynchronous perspective, it still makes sense, right? Like that you want if you want things to run fast, uh, you want to minimize the propagation delay uh, to the output. Anyway, all right. Um, so uh, simulation, language processing stuff uh, is what I want to get to today, partly so we can actually simulate some stuff. Back in one of the early DSL streams from like two weeks ago, I did show uh, a couple of simple uh, interpreters and compilers for the 
very simple bit-oriented language we had at the time. Uh, Rattle as it stands, while it's by no means kind of complete in terms of the vocabulary of different types and operations you can do, it's much more uh, expansive and, uh, you know, uh, I rarely find myself reaching for stuff that isn't there. So it's going to be, you know, there's a bunch more stuff to, to make work in the simulator. And actually the biggest thing is probably, well, there's bit vectors. So all the bit vector operations have to be implemented rather than just doing individual bit operations. And also um, modules, you have to handle modules somehow. Uh, not, because modules are not just a top-level thing, uh, they're also that you can have sub-modules. And so how do you deal with that when you're doing simulation? Um, and uh, the easiest way is to inline the modules away. Um, uh, and I won't talk a lot about why that's sometimes necessary, but it turns out that you can have two modules that if you look at things at one level of the hierarchy, have a cycle between them, meaning you have an input from, from module A going to an or an output of module A going to an input of module B, and then you have an output of module B going to an input of module A. And uh, that's not necessarily a cycle at the wire level. This doesn't represent a so-called combinational loop. It's entirely possible and usually the case, unless you made a design bug, that if you crack open the modules and look at the actual wires, there are no combinational loops. But if you look at things at the level of a big black box with a bunch of wires going between them in both directions, it's very frequent that you have um, a loop. And for example, anytime there's a handshake between two modules, you're going to have uh, you know wires going in both directions so they can kind of acknowledge each other's requests. Um, and so if you simulate them at the level of a, of a black box, you have a problem of which one do you evaluate first. And so in order to evaluate things uh, at that black box level, you have to do fixed point iteration where you run them multiple times until their output stabilize, and that's inefficient. And one way you can get around that is just by inlining things uh, away. Um, and you know, unlike function inlining, where for example recursive functions, you can't keep inlining them because you never make you know there's always a remaining self reference or whatever. Um, the kind of the uh, module hierarchy we have is fully static, and so you can always bottom out and just operators and nodes rather than modules. Um, and so even if you don't always do it, it's certainly an easy way to handle modules is just to have a pass that completely inlines them away. And so the first thing I'll do is I will write a module inliner and then we'll use that to write the simulator. But the module inlining is also just useful in its own right. All right, so uh, I can't remember how much of this I covered on stream, if any. I think I did cover a bunch of this on stream, but um, the way a module works, well, first, actually, let me just quickly review how you define a module. You define a module by somehow providing it a dictionary, and the dictionary maps names to um, to nodes. Some of those nodes are input nodes, and some of them are output nodes, uh, and those ultimately find the external interface. Um, then there's also internal names that are just sort of for the designer's, co designer's convenience. Um, those don't have any interface uh, visible. Uh, presence, but they're used just for debugging to label things so you can actually see them in the diagrams. Um, and so you can actually just, like this function here, actually just takes effectively, it just takes a, uh, a dictionary, which is the namespace. Um, but it so happens that it can populate that namespace from a function's local local variables dictionary or from a class's uh, class dictionary. Um, and so when we do stuff like this here, really all we're doing is we're just using a class as a namespace that we can make some definitions in. And then really what, what Rattle cares about is that there's a dictionary which maps you know, the string i to whatever this node is and so on. Um, and so that's, that's how this stuff works in case you're curious. That's really the idea there. Uh, and there's some, some tricks in, in terms of how I extract the function uh, the locals variable, the local variables dictionary from a function, uh, which requires some bytecode hacks like this, but it's pretty simple. Um, but, uh, but but anyway, so that's the idea behind a module. Um, inside a module, when you call these uh, functions input and output, they are just constructor functions that construct certain types of nodes. Uh, the input function constructs an input node. The output function constructs an output node. Um, and so um, if you think about what you want to do when you inline a module, what you want to do first for the input nodes is when I instantiate a module in the context of a certain set of input port binding. So there's a certain set of external things that are connected to the input ports of, uh, of a module instance. I essentially want to make a copy of the internal module template, you know, the circuit that's the internals, but I want to replace all references to the input nodes with their corresponding external, uh, whatever thing is externally connected to that thing. 
So it's like a deep copy uh, that we did way back in the DSL stream, but um, but when we see a reference to an input node, instead of hooking things up to the input node, we want to hook it hook things up to whatever the input node is associated with externally. So that's the idea. That's really the only thing you have to do for module inlining. Um, so um, so let me uh, let me write the code for that. And we're going to be using a visitor. Um, if you look at the original experiments, um, a copier is pretty much the simplest thing in the world. Um, you just you, you you visit your graph, and you make copies of whatever the types of nodes are you run into. Um, and um, I think I have an example of how. Uh, when you have a copier, you can override some of the nodes in order because most of the time you just want to copy copy stuff recursively. Um, but then for some nodes, you can make substitutions. And uh, in this example we did back then, I make a substitution where if there's an XOR, I replace it with a corresponding and or not representation. Um, but everything else is just kind of copied in a pass through fashion. So this is basically the same sort of thing we want to do. We're going to define a copier. Uh, a copy or visitor, and then we're going to overwrite it um, for uh, to hook up the input node to um, based on a dictionary of what that thing is associated with in that context. So, um, I guess it'll be a copier visitor. Um, Yeah, I guess there's not much to it. I guess the main thing is I have to make sure I cover all the different node types. Um, but I can start. I mean, we can test it piecemeal. So, but let me just remind myself of what the different nodes are. Uh, concat, index, slice. Let me actually try to remember how you split the window. Um, concat node. Index node, slice node, when node, uh, register node. I guess we don't have to handle that today. Constant node, binary node for binary operators. There's a unary, pair node, input node. Um, Output node, and then I guess there's the instance. There's the instance input node, and the instance output node. Okay. Um, how do you unsplit? I guess I'll just keep this to the side. So um, we don't have to handle them all in one gulp, but um, we can test it piecemeal with, without handling everything, but uh, let me just walk through. Most of these are, um, are pretty self-explanatory. They correspond to different kinds of operators, different kinds of nodes. Concat is for concatenating bit vectors. So this is how you construct bigger, bit, bigger bit vectors from smaller bit vectors. Index is how you uh, pull out a single bit from a bit vector. Slice is how you put out a sub-bit vector slice from the bigger bit vector. When is for multiplexing. Registers for creating registers. We won't cover that right now. Constant is just when you have a constant value of a given type. Binary and unary are for binary and unary operator nodes. Compare is when you have you know two things that are compared. So you take two bit vectors and you get out a single bit. So these things here are basically bitwise operators. Um, the output is the same. You know if you if you XOR two bit vectors, you get the same type out as you put in. Compare uh, goes from you know two bit vectors to a single bit. So that's why it has a it's marked differently. Input node and output node, like I just described, are internally from from inside a module definition. Those are your external inputs and outputs. Instance input node is when you instantiate a module. Uh, the input node and output node, uh, from your perspective, are represented by those nodes, and they're actually, um, you know, kind of have opposite polarity in a sense, um, because what, you know, anyway. Uh, so, so this is basically like these two counterparts are the internal and external views of a port, essentially. So we have to handle all of those cases for the copier. Um, let's see. Uh, we have to handle cycles. So one thing that was different, uh, which I should mention, one thing that's different 
uh, about the original copying and other visiting stuff we did is that we have to handle cycles. We actually already handle cycles in our GraphWiz generator, but let me just talk about what's different. Um, if you look at the visitor, it will still complain if you have cycles. And it does that by, you know, this whole thing is memorization based. When it's, um, when it's visiting a node, it sets the state, it sets the value associated with the node temporarily to a marker value called visiting. And then if it ever re-enters that node, and sees that visiting marker, uh, it says there's a cycle. Um, however, um, and, and this is the correct default behavior. Um, if you want to write a recursive memorization type thing, this is really the only reasonable default. But um, what you can do and often have to do um, is if, um, and so just to be clear, for example, if you're writing a simulator, uh, it probably assumes that at that point when you're simulating, you've already removed any cycles like module level cycles or something like that. You, you've inlined everything away to the point where things are data dependencies are now acyclic. Um, but there are certain things like deep copying where you want to handle cycles, obviously. And the way you handle that is before you, re you recurse, you have to put in a placeholder value that's partially filled in for the result. And so for the dot generator, the way this works currently is that there's a make name function. This is for the dot generator. But basically what it ends up doing is it ends up setting a value that's associated which is basically like the next time someone calls uh, the function, the visitor function for this node, they will get back this path as the, as the result. And they call this make name function before they recurse. And so uh, you've already filled in the entry with something other than the visiting marker value by the time you recurse. And so you can never, um, you can never run into issues. Um, the, um, Let's see. That may actually like uh, I, I, this making me realize. So anyway, so what do you want to do if you're doing something like deep copying? Um, I mean, let's take say a, a unary node. Um, if you want to deep copy a unary node, and you, so so first let me handle it without cycles, which is basically what we had before. Um, you you can just call the constructor. Um, so I guess it's node op node operand. So you just basically you just call the constructor uh, with values from this. Oh, and then you have to, for the operand, you have to recursively copy it, of course. So that's what self does. You use self as a function, you call it. Now, this is going to yield a cycle issue. I mean, I can even show it to you, I suppose. Um, Trying to remember. Right, you don't have to provide anything. Okay. So if I do something like this, um, and um, you have to be a little bit tricky, but for example, in order to create cycles, uh, you typically have to do some mutation, unless there's some utility that hides the mutation for you. So suppose you write um, c equals, or actually, I guess I can just write, if I write y equals not x, um, and I write copier y, um, then, oh, wait, I guess we're not handling the input case yet, so let's just fill that in just to illustrate these things. Um, okay. So um, we have, what is it? Okay, yeah, so we didn't even call the function yet. So we have a copy and you can see um, you can see they're distinct just to prove the point. Whereas y of course is equal to itself. Uh, now suppose I cheat and I say y operand equals y. This is one way of creating a cycle. So this is like an inverter loop, self inverter, self self inverting inverter. I don't know what you call it. Simple inverter loop. Um, if you do this, you're going to get a cyclic node graph error. Um, however, 
and and you don't want this like you want to be able to express cyclic structures at least at some level even if they if they eventually disappear when you inline it at least in an intermediate stage you're going to have cycles quite frequently like registers for example um, typically have a cycle between the next value port and the current value port that's I mean, there's usually feedback there so um, the way you do it is before you recurse you basically make a, a placeholder so um, And, and this is where I think the way my constructors currently work may be an issue, so I may have to refactor them because I'm not sure if I can uh, put in placeholders because I think they use type inference right now for uh, filling them in. So um, I think I have to do this. Like basically, what you I think what you have to do is you have to fill in. Um, actually, let me. Just return it so you can chain easily. Um, you have to do something like this. Um, you have to basically fill in a placeholder value where you have the right type for the node, um, but some parts are not filled in. Um, and uh, and then you recurse like this. Uh, something like that. And I think the reason this won't work right now is because these constructors are a little too smart. Um, I think they infer the type. They infer the type from the operand. And so I could put in the old operand um, and then hook it up later. Um, but that's a little bit dangerous because accidentally you could end up with references for other things that are reaching down and, and hooking it up. But uh, for now, we can try to do this. Um, and then I'll think about it another time. But uh, if you do this instead, then this should work. And now if you look at, first off, if you look at the original Y copy uh, operand, this is a cycle. So if you look at, you know, it points to itself basically. And now we should also have Y copy point to itself. Okay. Oh no, not not to why. It's a point to itself, right? So it does. So this is basically the idea behind how you um, behind how you handle cycles. You fill in the right basic node type, so it has the right identity for the final value. But you fill in. You can only fill in the fields after you've inserted it. And so that way, if during the recursion someone wants to link back up to to this, like in in this case itself then the thing has already been constructed and then all you have to do after coming back from the recursion is setting those fields to their correct values. Um, so yeah, that's the basic idea. Um, um, let's just go and look at some of these nodes. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out any of this smart stuff, like uh, like you can see what I'm doing here as I'm using the operands type in the constructor in order to infer the type for the node as a whole. I think I'm going to take that out. Um, and, um, and I'm just going to sort of quickly Um, quickly audit them to make sure that they behave that way. All of them, I mean. Um, then I have to fix up the references, but that shouldn't be too bad. Right, like stuff like this is... This is this case. Um, I, mean, I guess I maybe for now. Let, let's keep it so that you always provide the type as the first thing. Um,
Actually, let me think. Maybe this is not really necessary. It's only really necessary when when it's based on the operands that are not static. Um, so I think this case here for sure needs to be that way. Register node, yep. Yep. Uh, this one, this one. This one is always a bit. There's real, no real thing you have to provide here. Um, Okay, these other ones look okay. Now, after we did this, we're going to get errors because, yeah, we're not calling these things. Um, so, um, This is also a little more explicit for bit shifts. So bit shifts have an asymmetry between the left and right operands in terms of how they determine the overall type. Same in C, right? Like um, you can have a five bit shift, but the value is 32 bits on the left. So you always want to use the left type in that case. Uh, and you don't have to verify. You can see one of the differences between this binary node and the shift node thing is that even though they both represent it as binary nodes, uh, one of them checks that both left and right types are the same, but not in the other case. Um, I guess when node as well. Um, okay. Makes me feel better because now we can um, we can plug in the uh, the node type as the first argument and then we can plug in the we can plug in none. And that works. Okay. Um, so anyway, we have to basically do this kind of thing for the different nodes. Um, let, let's handle the, the basic stuff first. Constant node um, is easy because we don't have any recursion, so we don't have to do the set stuff. Um, here we simply have what is it? A type and a value, right? Um, binary node. Um, Node op none none. Um, and we fill in these two operands. Uh, compare node. The type is implicit, so we just have to fill those in. Um, input node, output node. So this is inside the context of a so we'll do this. Okay, so yeah, the output node is Some some of this could be potentially automated more if you knew what fields there are and you had some schematic way of describing them. But um, for the most part, this is not this is going to handle um, you know the copy. We can actually inherit from it in order to reuse most of the functionality if we just want to replace certain things but copy everything else. So uh, maybe I'll think about boilerplate reduction at some later point. So input node, output node, 
constant binary node, unary node compare, input, output, instance. So instance input is when you have a module instance and you have a port going into the node. Um, and thinking about it, that corresponds to a submodule. Um, that's basically how submodules are reachable. Um, because you don't directly see the module. You see something that points into the module. Um, and so you have to copy the module instance. You're not co so for, for now, we're not doing inlining. We're just doing the copier, right? You have to copy the module instance. So um, so what is it? It's a type, and it's the name of the port, and then it's the module template, like the this is a, corresponds to a specific instance, I think. So if I'm not mistaken, when you um, this is a module instance. Um, so the, actually, and this is the super class of any module. So when this gets called, this represents the instance. Um, and I guess you really, you have to make, I guess I can just call this constructor again with a new set of keyword arguments. Um, to hook things up. Let's see. Because this already makes copies of those uh, instance input nodes. Um, so I can just, I guess, copy the connections maybe. For now, let's just say we're recursing in here. And so here we have a module instance. Um, and uh, if you were to create a new module instance, I guess you would take the type of the module and you would call its constructor. Um, And um, what is the connections matrix? Okay, so it's just the names and nodes. I think that's fine. Um, Actually, it looks like you can use this module connections thing directly, so maybe you can just do that. Um, but the connections, I guess we have to copy um, because. And here I think we don't have to worry about recursion, do we? No, I think we do. So this instance, when we when we call this, we get a new module instance. And then you have to, uh, essentially, to get the corresponding input node, you have to take this one's name, and you have to get the corresponding attribute on that. Um, This is a little bit awkward, potentially. Well, let's not worry about cycles just for a moment. Um, 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 self, let's see, what was it? Self node or name node in module. 
connections. Items. Um, and so that's the new module. Um, I think you can actually, um, for instance output node, do we even use instance output node? Let me just see, instance output node. Oh yeah, of course we do. Um, I think it can you can treat it the same um, as far as this because really what you're interested in you're interested in copying the module instance um, and then looking at that thing under its name and in both cases they have a name and it's an attribute of that module so I think this should work for that so that covers these um, I mean I can do when as well uh, maybe I'll leave out, no, I, I don't have to leave out the bit vector stuff. So all of these have to be deferred. And then Oh, interesting. That's probably a, an issue too. Um, because it insists, yeah. That's probably not how you should do that, I guess. Um, for roughly the same reason as the other thing. Um, let me see where we're referring to concatenate right now. Okay. Um, okay, so then what we can do is we can use the same node type and then fill in, I guess, an, uh, I mean, I guess if we, if we want, we can, we can do this. We can at least fill in an empty array of the right shape. I don't think that should matter, but um, let's just do that. Um, Let's see. So no type, then a, an operands array of the right size, initially non, all nuns, and then fill in those guys. Index node. Um, so operand is none. The index is static, so um,
slice one. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, all right. Yeah, I guess let, let's make sure this still works. Um, okay, so now we should be able to. Let's see. Um, let's say this is a test module, and um, first let's just, I mean, let's write the kind of thing we've written a bunch of times before. Let's initially have no cycles, so um, We have this, and then we have O, which is X and well, X and Y, or not C. Okay. Then I'm going to make a copy. Um, Let me think. So what are you really copying? We were doing... Uh, right, you copy a node. I guess, I mean, if, if you do something like copy module, Um, I don't think I really have to copy a module. Um, let's see. Well, maybe I do. One thing I forgot with all of these is um, I do it like this. Um, by default, let's always copy the node name. Um, we can copy networks nodes to copy a module. Um, let's see. To do that, we have to copy everything connected to the output nodes. I think that's what it's called, right? It's just self outputs. Right. So, um, make a copier. And I believe it's a dictionary, so you have to do, do it like that. Uh, 
um, once you've done that, you can then I should factor this into a function. Because right now I only have the fancy front end, but I should probably Oh, well, let's not confuse those. Um, I'm guessing that's why I called it module name because it was colliding with that local thing. Okay. Just make sure I didn't break shit. Okay, so now we should be able to call this function directly for copy module. Um, copy module, uh, and let's say like new name. If new name is none, then new name is module name plus copy. Um, then we do a copy and it's new name. So just call this module name. So this is the module name, the namespace. I mean, we might want to have a version of the function that directly takes a list of inputs and outputs, but um, for now we can just um, we can just put these into one thing, and I suppose. We can copy the basis from that if it's important. All right. Um, so if I now do copy module test, I guess I'll call it test copy. I'll just use the default name. Let's see what happens here. Oh, right. Um, yeah, I suppose that's true. It's only some things that have Um, of names like this. I guess probably the way to do it is actually to do it like this. And then we only use this for um, we only use this function for copying nodes.
or display new territory and typos. Okay, so now we have a bunch of inputs and outputs. In space. Oh, this should be make module. Name space. Okay. And now we should be able to. Okay, so let's see if this comes through. And if we hover over it, it says test copy because it's been given a new name. All right, so that's the module level copy. Um, what are we doing on time? We've been going about an hour. So um, that's for the basic copying stuff. Now suppose you want to... Um, you want inline modules. And um, let's see what you want to do. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to define something called a module inliner, which is going to be a subclass of copier. Um, I'm going to provide an inputs dictionary, and which is going to be a mapping from input nodes to um, what they should be replaced with, basically. Um, it's like a context or an environment for rebinding those inputs. So um, I think the main thing we have to do was input node, def input node. Right. So basically, we're going to override this function so that um, and we're not going to recurse on that thing because we don't want to, let's see, maybe we have to, I guess we have to copy everything ultimately, but let's just for now say that um, you look up you look up the node um, like this. So there's a set of current inputs, and you look it up like that. Um, and so normally, when you would get a, a, a return value, which is the copy of the input node, you actually get back whatever that thing is bound to in that context. Um, I think then the other thing you have to do is any time, let's see, when you encounter a module, you have to inline it. And So it has it has a set of inputs and outputs. Um, and I guess connections. So really what matters are the connections. So you have a set of connections to each of those inputs. And then so you want to basically you want to inline the module um, in the context of whatever those module instances are. Or um, instance hook things. All right. Um, let me think for a sec. So we're in, we're in the process of inlining a module. We see an input node. And um, 
I guess what we're going to do actually is I guess there's two possibilities. Um, there's two possibilities. Because if it's a top level input, then we don't want to inline it. And so those are not going to have anything bound to it. So we're going to do this and none. Um, and then we'll say like uh, input uh, uh, connected node. Uh, if connected node is none, then connected node is going to be You know, we go, we do recursion, and then we actually go, or a super. We just uh, use the super code, just use the default code for copying, uh, for copying that. So this way, for any sub module, the input by nodes are going to disappear and get hooked up directly to their connection. But for the top level things that are part of the external interface, those are going to get copied like before. Um, okay, so then when we get to a module instance and we have to inline, what do we have to do? We have to recursively, dis we have to make a copy of the module essentially, which is what presumably the inline function does. Um, so we call inline module instance on this thing. What does that entail? Well, I think what you do um, for each of the inputs. There's a corresponding pin um, let me just remind myself of what this whole thing is. No, oh, sorry, that's the internal it's the things that are inside the module. I think what I want are the connections right um. So for each of these, um, this probably could be done cleaner. If this is, um, if that attribute is instance input node, um, either way, uh, if it's an input node, then we want to create a binding. Um, we want to create an association between
Okay, so if that corresponds to an input port, then we want to set up uh, a relationship between um, that input node internally and whatever it is bound to externally, which is this. And um, let's see, the outputs are slightly different. You don't have bindings for those, um, but what you want to do instead, well, let's do this first. Once you have this, you can essentially, you can inline the module in the context of those instance, in, instance inputs. And what this should return, I suppose, is the set of outputs. So I want this function to return a dictionary that maps the instance output nodes to whatever they are connected to on the inside. Um, so I haven't written this function yet, but I think this is what you end up wanting to do. Um, if you see an input instance input node, Actually, I'm not even sure this will be encountered. Output nodes, well, when you see an in instance output node, um, you recursively visit the module, which will end up inlining it the first time through. Subsequently, it will return this as a set of output connection. Once you have that set of instance outputs, you then look up um, I guess your node name. Return that. Is that right? Now that I think about it, even here, I think the way you do this is you say for um, for now you have to do this. You have to do the copying in the context of a brand new copier, I think. Um, or brand new inliner rather. Because the same internal thing can be visited multiple times at different instances, so you can't use the same thing in both cases. Um, so when we see an input output node, we recursively visit the output of uh, the module from which we get a, a set of, of things we should bind to, and then from that we pick out the one we want. And so for a module, we go through each of the connections. For each of them, we create an association between the internal node and the external connection. Then we recursively inline it. Um, and then I'll say inline module. It's going to be like this. And um, do it like this. Then I say return name inliner node for name node in module. I guess it's really module class. Something like this. And for the top level, it's none. So that um, if inputs is none, then this is just an empty dictionary. 
so that you can call it at the top level, in which case it won't replace any inputs, but then anything below that will be replaced. Okay, first let's try, I mean, this has very low probability of working in the first try, but um, suppose we just do this. Let me just comment this shit out. Um, but suppose we, we look at this. So this is the top level invocation. There's an imp, you know, there's this thing here. No idea why it just stepped like that. That's, that's the bugger is garbage sometimes. Okay, and now we in. So, oh. So, inliner is none. Oh, a little more fun. So that's why the, the code was stepping in that weird way. Um, the reason this happened is that I should call my super. Interesting. Oh, I guess for a top level, that's true. So we don't get back, uh, and in fact, let's not even, let's not do it like that. Um, You can do essentially the same thing, but using the inliner instead of the copier. So you start with an inliner. Um, you start with an inliner with no input bindings because we don't want the top level input nodes to be replaced. Um, I'll call this. Well, let's just call it like it was. So we do it like that. Um, so this shouldn't really do anything new, and that's kind of the point. We want this to basically, um, yeah. Let me let me just make sure that I didn't screw something up. But this should basically behave like the copier, because none none of the interesting cases should be getting hit here. So it's called W now, so that the, the changes were picked up. Okay, now let's um, 
let's start simple. Suppose you have an end module and um, I1, I2. That was called XOR. And the output is just computes the XOR. And um, suppose we hook those up. And then we use it like this. So now we have a submodule that does the same thing as before. But, um, you know, and, and let's look at that before we try to inline it. Okay, so there, there's some code that's not handled right now. Um, let me just show you what that is, just so we're clear on what's supposed to happen. So the same basic thing, but now we've encapsulated the submodule uh, that does the XOR. And uh, now I want to try to inline it. So uh, let's set some breakpoints where things are going to get interesting. Um, basically, all of this stuff here. Um, so right. So there's no entry. So this is a top-level input node. There is really um, not much to say about it. It's going to copy it. Um, okay, so those are the three original inputs. Those presumably didn't get copied. Now we get to instance output. That means that, um, I mean, we can look at what exactly this is, but um, this is going to be the dot O of that XOR module. And so this is where we are going to descend into, oh, that, oh, right. We have to have a default handler. I, I forgot. Uh, let me show you how we did that before. It's funny, I could have sworn. Oh no, actually we have that in the original code. What am I talking about? Uh, you have to handle it a little bit differently because each module is a different type. So we need a default handler. Um, we could probably factor this code out. Okay, so now we make it over here. So now we're being asked to inline um, the specific instance, which has a set of connections. You can see I is connected, I1 is connected, I2 is connected. So we get the module class, which is the one that has like the internal structure of the module. Each of those is the same for different instances. The internals are the same. It's just the external connections that are different. And so we go through each of the connections and I guess we, let me uh, step to here. Let's look at what the instance input says. So it should be a relationship between um, yeah, it should be a mapping between the input node Right, there's two. I don't know. See, so anyway, uh, we're not. It's not really what I meant to say.
Okay, so that's, I guess in this case it is correct. It's a little bit confusing because it looks like there's an input node in both cases, but if you look at one and look at the other, they should be different. One of them is coming from the outside, right? So it's associating on the left, it's associating I1, and it should associate it with the external X node. So similarly for this one here, this should be I2 associated with Y. So this is what we're hooking up. So the first element of this tuple should always be an input node. The other one can be whatever it's hooked up to externally. Generally not going to be an external input node unless you're directly hooking up to a top level input. So anyway, that all looks good to me. Now we go into inline module. And so we create a new module inliner, um, which now has that set of input bindings. Now if I run a, a F5, um, now this connected node, yep, so there's actually a connected node. And so now instead of copying, uh, if you look at this argument here, instead of copying this I1, it should be getting a connected node instead, which is the external thing. Okay, that seemed to work. It basically worked in the first try, so that's a little too miraculous, except for this, I forgot the default handler. Okay, that part is not right, so what happened? Um, we did manage to inline X. We did manage to inline the XOR. I think we ended up copying the output node when we really shouldn't. Right. So when I, I see what's going on. So um, Let's see. I think what you want is the operand. You don't want the output node. You want the output operand, output node operand. So you want to get rid of those outputs. You just get rid of these breakpoints. How do you clear the breakpoints? Okay. Yay! That worked! Uh, sorry, let me just check chat. A def can have it in it. No, it can't. That was clearly because I had a typo. Is that from earlier or do I still have that? I'm, I'm very bad about sometimes typing def when I mean class. And Python will go along with it for a long way because you can have nested definitions. Um, all right, so that works. The only problem now is that um, somehow the inputs from the original submodule have leaked. We, we've gotten duplicates of them. Yeah, no, they, they, not only can they be removed, that's clearly a bug, and I'm not quite sure where they're coming from, because there's they're not coming from the nested submodule. It's basically like they're relics from the um, – actually, I think I know what it, what's happening. The problem is inside when, – when they're being visited from the submodule inliner – I see, that's the problem. When they're being visited from the submodule inliner – you're, they're getting copied. So, um,
No. But let me let me think for a sec. That shouldn't happen. But I assume that is kind of what's happening. So when you're because you shouldn't be able to have two instances of the same thing, but but in different levels of the, the in the diff, in a different inliner, it can happen that the thing gets copied again. Oh yeah, no, that that will happen actually. Um, what's the easiest way to ignore it? We need to distinguish things that. Um, So it's first visiting the output node, and this is the output node for the for O of the XOR module. Um, and so we recursively go in and visit, that's for the operator. And we look at the left operand, and um, Right, and so this is where this node here is I1 and the connected node is X. But we're never visiting X itself in this context. Um, Like, so I, I thought maybe because in this context it could get copied. Like, let, let me check that again. Let me set a breakpoint here and see if it ever gets re entered with X. Uh, then I'll look at the stack at that point to see what the path is. No, so that's the second one. That's fine. Now, so it never gets revisited because I thought maybe that way you can see how maybe it could get copied. Um, In the graph dot, the input nodes are a result of visiting these things. So I guess if I had to, if I had to guess, the problem would somehow be that um, I guess let's look at it that way. Okay, so we're now we've created all of the new namespaces with copies of everything. Uh, we only have one copy X, Y, and Z, so that's correct. We only have one W, and that's correct. So here, nothing is duplicated. There must be another copy of something in there like in order for these things to be to end up here orphaned it must mean that they were, they were reachable by something but the problem is if they were reachable why isn't there an arrow from them um let's dive into test two here By the way, one of the things I like about 
the, the Visual Studio Code debugger for Python is when you're using the debug REPL, it has this kind of embedded tree view stuff, which I like. Um, but anyway, let's let's just dive into it and see if we can find the duplicate somewhere in the reachable stuff. So we have a set of outputs. First of all, we have, you know how this could happen? This could happen if these inputs here are not related to the inputs that are actually externally hooked up. So uh, let me show you what I mean. Suppose I take um, test two outputs W. Um, dot left dot left is that right um, no dot operand dot left dot left so this should be x and it is x but I bet that if you compare to this one they're not the same Right. These are part of the same Let me try something. This might eliminate it, um, but it. No, I guess it really wouldn't. The other possibility is that they're not even from. Like they're they're uncopied versions of the original thing. Um, right. So in the copier version of this, we actually do copy stuff. Um, so that's all good. So actually, it makes a fresh copy of that input node. But you should only be getting one copy because of the memorization. So if you reach it indirectly through different paths. Um, you should only get one. I mean, just to prove that point, suppose we do this twice. Uh, this shouldn't generate now three copies. If, if, if that's what's happening, then things are very bad. Um, so that doesn't happen. Um, and by the way, you could do this. Uh, actually, that, that would have different problems. But approximately, like at least at a superficial level, this should fix it. Yeah, but that's not really the true fix because okay, this can't be too complicated. So we have the inputs nodes that are directionally reachable from this top level array. And then we have the ones that are indirectly reachable through this. Um, let me just verify this is crazy town, so this really shouldn't be the issue. But let's just verify at least the very, very original module that hasn't gone through inlining that that has something reasonable here. So let's let's look at C as an example. No, actually, now that I think about it, it has to be stuff related to the submodule. So we can actually eliminate, like, um, you can see that C doesn't get duplicated. So it's only stuff that's reached somehow through. Um, oh, I know what it is. I know what it is. Yep. Okay. So the problem is when we were setting up these instance bindings, we were using we're binding to the original node rather than the copy of the node. And so the the one we were binding to was actually the one from the very original module. Um, it's probably worth at some point to 
uh, when you make a module to actually have to somehow associate ownership with modules so that um, you can figure out when you're mixing things from different modules in a unclean way because that would have shown this up um, but because things are you know like in a, in a in a graph one of the nice things is you can share things without knowing their what, what context they're originally designed for but in the case of modules you do kind of want uh, like a membrane where you can't accidentally get nodes out of the internals of a module uh, in this case we're doing a low-level thing anyway but um, it's probably worth uh, doing so anyway um, let's try doing this um, um, I mean I don't know suppose we wanted to let's just be really really overkill uh, suppose we wanted to uh, we wanted to basically uh, write the XOR as follows I1 and not I1 or I2 or so we just write the sum of products representation for it if we do this this is the same thing uh, you know in terms of the truth values um, but then we can um, we can use some submodules for this just because I want to see at least two levels of inlining before I feel good about myself Okay, so that works. Um, I think we've already gone almost two hours, so uh, the simulation stuff is um, is not going to fit into today's schedule. But honestly, this was the part that I was, I wouldn't say I was dreading, but I realized that even though it's conceptually not that complex, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's the hardest part of doing the simulation is dealing with this stuff. And so the rest of it is fairly rote. And so I am happy that this, uh, and, and, and you know, in hindsight, even though there's a few things to debug, look how simple it ended up. Um, it's mostly just copying stuff, except for these couple of things related to modules that we had to override. And uh, yeah, pretty happy with that actually. And I also realized that Instance input node, you never have to copy because that's not something you refer to. Um, actually, that's not true, I guess. But anyway, so that's pretty good effort. Um, seems to work. Haven't. Well, um, actually, we, we let me do a torture test before we leave. Uh, let me do a torture test. The torture test is um, um, cyclic test, something cyclic. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have I mean, it's, it's going to be kind of trivial, actually. Uh, Let's just make it a single bit. This might expose some issues. Um, so the idea is I'm going to hook up this uh, I1 uh, I1 goes to let's just say I so I is like the external input bit 
Um, but then I2 is actually cyclic O1, and then our output is cyclic O2. So really what we're doing is we're just doing two inversions. The initial input comes from us, so there's no true cycle, um, but the module has wires that go back into itself. So at the module level, there's a cycle, um, but if you crack it open and inline it, then it's just a, a, an acyclic uh, chain of, of two inverters. Um, but I bet that could show up some issues if we're not handling cycles correctly. All right, so at least that level. Um, actually, first let's just, yeah. Um, before I even run this, let's just look at it directly to, to show you the cycle I'm talking about. So, um, we feed in the external eye into the I1 port, and from our point of view, it looks like you know, it depends. It's a, it's a cycle, and it is. I mean, at this level, um, but we know internally that really this is just a double inverter chain that feeds out to O2. So there's there's no real there's no real issue. It just looks problematic maybe at this level. Um, and then if we inline it, right? So there are issues with that. Um, yeah, and I think this was one. This is a good thing to fix before I finish off the stream. So the problem is, we fully resolve the module, including all inputs, before we fill in anything. Until we resolve this, we actually don't know what to connect to. Now that I think about it. Um, so we can't even create a, t a temp node. That's not totally true. Uh, what we can do I think that was the best way to do it. Um, Um, for each of the so these are instance um, these are instance outputs um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to set node that node um, I guess the problem is I have to create placeholder for everything I have to create placeholders for everything before I can recurse on any of them Okay, one way we can do that is we can factor out um, like if I could do the equivalent of this as a reusable operation, I don't want to have to do my own case analysis over and over. Um, Actually, let me do something else instead, uh, which is a usable thing, and then we can get rid of it in a, in a second step. Um, and this is kind of a cheat. Actually, it's not a cheat. This is totally something you want to a thing you want to support anyway. Um, 
We're going to create something called a wire node. And a wire node is basically just a pass through. Um, and if you ever want to do feedback loops combinationally, especially, you need something like this anyway. Um, I guess. Let's just do something like this for now. Um, then I, you, uh, you make a wire. Um, Let's just quickly make this stuff. Um, okay, um, let me just test wires first. And before we get to this stuff here. Um, okay, so we're back to this. Let's put a wire around the output. Um, what visitor is this? All right, let's not let's not inline it just for the moment. Um I mean that looks reasonable, but what's up with uh what what's the header thing? I'm trying to remember what it does. Okay, so let's let's just have this for now. So the so the only, the idea behind a wire it's not really the wire. It's really more like an indirection node. But calling it a wire, uh, it's probably more evocative because one of the main reasons for having it is is that you can have a node that's basically just a pass through. It has a given type, so you assign the type up front, but you can change what it's hooked up to later. Um, and this makes some of these things easier. And then if you want, you can have a pass later that squeezes out all the wires. Um, like it just forwards the wires once we're done. Um, but, but in this case, I think it's going to make it easier. And so what I'm going to do in the module inliner is um, I'm going to make a wire node. Oh, no, that's not the right one. Um, I'm going to make a wire node 
associated with my type and initially connected to nothing. Um, and then once I know uh, what things are hooked up to, then I can hook it up to the right thing. Like that. I, I guess I do have to... Um, and actually, we can make the copier inline wires if we want. Um, but let me just... Um, First, we had this example. Let's just make sure nothing broke. So you can see now there are wires, uh, wire nodes at every level of inlining, um, or indeed at every, I guess, yeah, at every level of module uh, hierarchy. Um, if we want, we can then. Well, we, let's just leave those wires in for now. Um, but let's now see if this thing works. Okay, that still doesn't work. So let's see. Well, I guess there's multiple things that could need wires, actually. Uh, so I, I guess I don't know for sure. So this thing here... Um, we're re-entering okay I see yeah I, I guess I didn't quite put it at the right place so um, Let me think about it. When the module re-enters itself, I think this here we can actually do as we were before. And then where we want to insert wires is here. Um, the thing you want to associate with the module are the instance outputs. And so I'm going to create a placeholder um, um, going to create a placeholder association uh, which are wires 
wires that have the right type. So it has the right type, but it's not hooked up to anything. And then you can associate uh, the module with those instance outputs. And then when you recurse down here, um, what you can do here is you can update them to be the re to be the real deal. So they, or sorry, no, you update the the operands to point to the right thing here. Something like that. Let me just go over that in my head. Go over the connections of those that are outputs. You create temp wires that have the right types but not connected to anything. And then you set that so you can immediately return if, if there's a cycle with the module. Then you visit all of the input nodes and they in turn can feed back to something that will then hit a wire and terminate the cyclic recursion. And then finally, after inlining the module, you go through all of the actual connectivity and you hook it up, something like that. Uh, Why did that not? <laughs> That's not the cyclic test too. That's bizarre. Okay, it actually wasn't rerunning it. Okay. Let's go through this. So we go through the instance outputs. Sorry, that actually makes sense. Um, Okay, so the inputs, the outputs now are O1 and O2, and they're both hooked up to wires that one presumes has the right. Okay, so now there's a key, there's a key error. Um, so here we have Oh, actually, that makes sense. Um, well, let's see. I don't know.
Okay. So the module we're dealing with in this instance is right. It's the cyclic module. And so we have the instance outputs. We know there are two from this thing, and they're hooked up to wires. Now you're supposed to get back from from this recursive call um, like if you look at module in this case right oh one oh two Um, let me just pull this out so I can look at it more. Was I forgetting to type items? I'm forgetting to type that. So result says O one. Okay, I I guess I was just I didn't type items or something like that. Um, that's fine. So it's just a typo. Nope, probably shouldn't delete it. Okay, so that's the cyclic module. <laughs> um, but now let's actually look at what it looks like when it lined. Okay, that's what we wanted. So you can see it completely unfurled this cycle. Um, and now we just have these in direction nodes every time it refers back to one of its own inputs during the inlining. But um, assuming things are not cyclic at the inline level, it's very easy to, in fact, actually, let me show you. Um, oh god damn, easy this shit is. Um, so all you do is um, when you have a wire, you just recursively visit the operand and you intentionally don't do the short circuiting to allow for cycles. So this is going to complain if there are cycles. Um, I should probably have a nicer way of, of composing these transformations, but um, for now, let's just. Um, no. I'm not averse to copy and paste. All right, I'm done. Um, but anyway, yeah. So you can see how 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 convenient it was to use wires. I think if if uh, I if I could structure the inlining a little bit differently, I d I don't have to use those intermediate wires. But it is convenient to have them because it means you can kind of have something to break what would otherwise be a a, a tricky cycle, and then in the end you can remove every, all the wires. And the wires themselves, I mean, they don't really cost anything, right? Um, as long as they don't proliferate too too insanely, but yeah, so uh, it's a module inliner and then it handles uh, module level cycles and all this other stuff and uh, 
okay, that took an extra 20 minutes from when I thought I was done, but uh, now I think we're really done. All right, cool. So uh, yeah, um, we're going to basically continue with this kind of stuff next time. Um, if, if people haven't been noticing, I've been doing some fun streams that are not really on the main roadmap that are just doing random programming or other interesting things that I think might be interest to some Bitwise uh, fans. So uh, I'm calling them the after hour streams. So I've been working through some uh, cryptographic uh, implementation and cracking challenges on stream. Uh, I don't know if I'm going up to upload them to YouTube yet, um, but uh, if anyone craves content, uh, look out for those. But uh, but anyway, I'll be back with my normal stuff uh, on Wednesday. So have a good time, and uh, I'll see you then.